You're listening to Central Wisconsin's 24-hour information station, AM 1320 WFHR. It's time now for the Morning Magazine, brought to you by Comfort Air Heating, Cooling, Plumbing. Now, with the Morning Magazine, here's Carl Hilke. Thank you, Jerry, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's show on AM 1320 and streaming live at WFHR.com. We also welcome our friends from Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. Jesse's getting uh, my good side and showing you why I have a face for radio. And the reason why they're all here is uh, we have Wisconsin Rapids Mayor Zach Verwink here for the entire hour, and we'll be opening up the phone lines, and the mayor's going to have a very special guest. We're going to have the new police chief of the city of Wisconsin Rapids, hopefully, uh, uh, during the program. But first off, we welcome the mayor of the city of Wisconsin Rapids, Zach Verwin. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Carl, and good morning to our listeners. I just wanted to touch on something. You know, it was kind of bittersweet last night, but, uh, you know, the rafter season came to an end. Yeah. yeah. But d- d- throughout this whole process, I was thinking, uh, look at all the exposure Wisconsin Rapids got through the season. Mm-hmm. And to make it to the playoffs and get the kind of recognition and seeing your city listed uh, on scoreboards, et cetera, et cetera, that's got to be worth a lot in terms of promoting. Midwest, right? When you think about where the new teams are based all mm-hmm. over in the division, South Division, North Division, now with having the two divisions, but most definitely it really is great reach and exposure for the city. You know, as people see it, as you mentioned, you know, just the everyday sort of things that, you know, as you mentioned, on the tickers on the bottom of the newscast to, mm-hmm. you know, just the mentions about how great the season was. I mean, they had a phenomenal season this year, a uh, historic season. And uh, so to be a part of that success, in addition to just the mentions and the, and the recognitions for the, the fact that there's a team base, here is, is certainly a, a great thing. And then you've had the, the improvements that has made that a real stadium. I mean, a real baseball stadium. And now with the aquatics park mm-hmm. planned for that, that, that whole complex area, that will be rather unique, I would think, in, in, among communities in the state of Wisconsin. I think it's going to be a destination far beyond what we believe today and and, and think to be true. I think, uh, you know, once we get shovels in the ground for some of these projects, then things start becoming more of a reality. But uh, most definitely, and that's something we've heard from from folks that are looking at investing in the Aquatic Center in particular, is they like the synergy between the energy that's happening with the rafters and Witter Field and the other users. It's not just the rafters, as mm-hmm. we know, um, but it's, you know, the fact that they're adding more uh, movie nights and concerts and those types of events that the, the cheese curd fest that's uh, the cheese fest beer and cheese fest that's coming mm-hmm. up in September. You know, there's a lot of ways for us to program and to enhance the use of these facilities beyond just their single use, such as baseball, or now we're talking aquatics or outdoor skating uh, or the skate park or the wintertime skating. You know, I think um, there it just demonstrates the amount of opportunities that exist for, for that. And then driving by the airport today, it looks like a jet port. Mm-hmm. I mean, some one of the jets I saw there was like a commercial site. Yeah. Jet, I mean, uh, that is um, highlights the need for that money in the budget to help improve or make th- those necessary improvements. That's a very busy airport right and now. We have not um, we have not achieved a peak season yet. So uh, to the extent that we've had a lot of traffic and I've gotten calls, some positive, some negative around the noise and some of the other impact. But uh, the reality is it's economic activity and uh, it demonstrates firsthand for anyone that wants to, to see it. Uh, the fact that there is new new opportunities uh, for economic development and it's being uh, translated into the, the users at the airport. Um, the fact that there's need there's a need for transfer service transport for those uh, folks that are coming and using the airport uh, to their final destination, uh, you know. So there's, it's really an exciting uh, thing, and I, I'm close to it every day. So I don't sometimes stop to pause, but I know that our airport staff are scrambling um, to accommodate uh, the the traffic on a daily basis, and uh, so it's very exciting. Well, you said when is the peak time expected? Uh, through August and September, so late late August here, but really into September, uh, the challenge is with the airport since we're on the topic um, we've got a, a major planned project for the airport this year uh, of which we're going to be putting in some taxiways and this has been a planned project for some time we've been designing it for all of five years um, as part of our long-range airport plan and uh, unfortunately we have to take some of the airport out of service uh, during some of that peak time so there will be impact adverse impact on the uh, on the use of the airport um, but we're 
communicating with Sand Valley in particular because that's where the peak traffic is attributed to throughout the uh, fall here uh, to try to make accommodations, maybe to plan certain trips around different things um, and to be proactive as opposed to, oh, a plane shows up and, and you know, they don't they didn't know that there were some services or amenities that were unavailable because of construction. Uh, Common Council last night took up some items involving development mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, uh, multifamily residential district and like where, where would you like to begin today on, on these topics? Well, a lot of a lot of stuff happened. It was a fairly quiet meeting. I think the, co the committees, as always, you know, do most of the lifting for council. So when people watch common council meetings, there isn't unless there's a real hot button issue that wasn't resolved through committee. They don't typically see that. But, you know, the committee meetings had, um, you know, there was a, the planning commission, which was a report from the, the a proposed boarding house, mm -hmm. uh, a rooming house, I guess, um, up on Strawberry Lane, which was faced with a lot of opposition. And um, so we didn't have the full information to make a recommendation at the planning commission level um, so we're going to be meeting actually next Wednesday uh, Tuesday I'm sorry uh, to resolve that issue and to, to decide either with an up or down vote uh, recommendation to the council on that that topic um, and uh, which you know goes to show there's need for transitional housing in this community that might serve um, those that are maybe just getting out of some jail time uh, those that may be in a situation where they simply don't have a place to live for a moment because of life circumstances um, and so there was a there was an applicant that decided that he saw an opportunity to to bring those services to the community he's a local guy somebody I went to high school with actually um, and so that's a unique uh, project but I'm not so sure where that's gonna head at this stage uh, given the, the amount of opposition and, and unique nature of, of that business. Um, but we also took action on... Um a couple of things, one of which was related to the Triangle development. I was going to ask you about yeah. that. So we've got Gorman and Company is the mm. named developer now. Uh, they're based in Oregon, Wisconsin. Um, very common uh, developer uh, in the Milwaukee and, and uh, Madison, uh, Fox Valley markets to some degree. But they, they typically operate in those more larger markets. But as the economy has picked up around the state, um, these developers are looking for projects elsewhere. And so like the North Point developers that I'll talk about in a second, Gorman... Uh, um, submitted a request uh, a response to our request for proposals uh, early this summer and um, so now we're we're moving forward with a letter of intent with them a lot of due diligence that needs to okay. happen. Explain a lot these of, terms for folks. Sure. So, in effect, it gives them the rights to negotiate with the city about the property and the future reuse of the property. So, um, we're not going to be talking with or, or accepting other developer proposals at this stage, um, but we will be working with them through. I think the timeline on the agreement was was to December, or late December, early January. So that'll give us an opportunity to really, uh, for them to know that there's a serious level, uh, seriousness by the city, an effort by the city to really um, flesh out what might be um, the aspects of that development. So determining number of housing units to the extent that we can get market rate housing down down in that, that uh, tract of land, uh, or even things like underground parking. Um, so there's a whole business case study to all of the aspects of that development ultimately has to cash flow. Right, it has to pay for itself, and um, you know it, the market is unproven in the downtown when it relates to housing and market rate housing. Anecdotally, I hear from folks, "Gosh, it'd be great to live downtown and to be close to things and be able to walk um, and maybe downsize to one car." You know, but we really haven't formally validated that market. Our housing study says that there's market opportunity. We've done a follow-up study uh, of, to identify in that tract of land specifically, but with a census of seven people in effectively living in our formal downtown uh, proper area, we just don't know. So uh, Gorman has agreed to um, negotiate and to discuss and explore many aspects of that project. Um, we also believe, as we have in, all along, wanted to build some retail space into the building at the first level. and. That's another unproven market. There's so many dynamics in retail right now that it probably isn't a bricks and mortar national retailer that we'd be looking to attract there, but to cultivate small businesses, whether it's a coffee shop and a bakery or a deli, a small restaurant. Um, there's also a question if you bring 40 to 60 housing units and maybe that many or times two 
people living residents living downtown you have a need for for grocery and for food and so that will create a food desert is what it's called so the extent that we might be able to attract a small convenience store or grocer or co-op um, to that space is also kind of up in the air and of consideration right now all of which uh, Gorman has done some things in the Racine market to that effect where they've actually brought a food co-op um, into the building and so into their developments in, in Racine um, so we're very excited about moving forward with Gorman and um, you know we've we've long had a concept in mind this will allow us to test that concept and see what their reaction is to building that concept well and the fact that they applied and they say yeah let's uh, we want to be considered mm -hmm. um, doesn't that uh, validate uh, the general idea of the development? It sounds like they have done this type of development in other communities, correct? They have, and, and in effect, they have a, a great de degree of confidence to be able to sign on the dotted line that we're willing to invest our time and our money into further exploring uh, feasibility for the project. Mm -hmm. So okay. we're very excited about so, that. that so, so they got exclusivity until right. December. Right. If it doesn't work out or they walk away, and then uh, you would open it up for other developers. And in the past, you've told me that there were like three other there were companies mm -hmm. that said at that time they weren't ready, but next year mm -hmm. they would be ready. So that's right. why the timeline is the way it exactly. is. Exactly, exactly. And and developers typically won't work with you unless there's an exclusivity presented, right? And sure. So we would have the option also to extend. So if there are, if we feel that there's a comfort level um, internally that we think that these guys are making progress and, and you know, we're feeling confident in their uh, effort, then we could also recommend an extension to that negotiation. Has Gorman been involved in any developments that, that we might be uh, familiar with in our area? In or? Wisconsin Rapids, no. Or um, in other central uh, Wisconsin. Wausau, they've done some projects up in Wausau. I do not believe they have any projects in Stevens Point or Marshfield. Um, the big project that if folks go to Madison ever um, on uh, Union Corners, which is kind of on uh, past the airport in the back way into, into Madison, is it is it 151? I guess that would take you past there. It's near Ella's Deli and okay. some of those places. I know. Um, they were the master developer on a tremendous amount of housing units that just went up. There's a UW Credit Union, UW Host the Health. They've got a small health campus there and things. Um, they're they're at that development, so people can drive by and it's it's a huge development. So this is a quality developer. That's, That's right. not, and that has to make you and the council feel uh, more confident going forward about the validity or uh, the viability of the triangle project i would think very much so and it's an affirmation that there is um a desire to be in this market it's a that people are willing to invest a, a great deal of money in this case we're talking a 10 to 20 million dollar development so it's not a small development by any means and further none of the components in our in our request for proposals scared them off i mean this was they're accustomed to this work so it wasn't like um they were inexperienced or you know didn't didn't have the foresight to say, well, this isn't really a, an opportunity for us, but they, they believed everything in the proposal. Um, now, their first proposal wasn't a, wasn't ideal. There was some uh, mixed income housing, which this may end up having some component of it, um, but there was heavily tax subsidized um, you know, proposal, and, and we just felt that's not what we want, but if you're willing to work with us on what we want, then then we give you the opportunity, and, and that's where we're Well, at. sometimes when you get, it's like a stew. Everybody puts in something, and uh, you get a great dish. I mean, yeah. some you might get a, a really wonderful development mm -hmm. from that's a mixture of a combination of ideas that right. people never thought of at, at first. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, let's talk about the other big uh, the North Point Development Corporation <laughs> to the development of real estate at 2330 16th Street South. So previously, this development, uh, for a reminder to our listeners, was the project that was proposed for 25th Street, uh, 25th mm -hmm. Avenue and Alton Street, um, just south of the station here, uh, right off of West Grand. Um, so the developer, uh, due to a, a tremendous amount of neighborhood opposition, um, that project was was reconsidered in a different site. And the site specifically is the f original advanced fiberglass technology. So across from Lincoln High School on 16th and Pepper, uh, also adjacent to this YMCA 
that's in the city as well as Renaissance um, Assisted Living. That developer has now submitted um, site plan uh, as well as um, received their tax credits and been awarded the ability for them to move forward on the site. So the first phase of that project will bring 40 uh, two and three bedroom units, uh, townhouse units to uh, the 16th and Pepper location. Uh, I saw the saw the architecture or drawings and things, and they're beautiful. They look like a very high quality development. They'll fit nicely in the neighborhood. Um, now we haven't completed our site plan. I'm, thinking there will be some revisions to that, but well landscaped. Um, the uh, development will have a clubhouse on site. Um, so this is uh, this is section 42 housing in which there must be a, you must be employed um, to live in. So there's some restrictions about employment to be able to live in the units, um, but there is some some market and subsidy uh, subsidized units within that facility. And that's a federal tax credit, uh, federal program that uh, the state administers at the local level. I think that's something we have to clarify. We're to, we're talking talking about people who are working That's right. <laughs> we're yeah. talking people who are uh, you know they're making their climb up the economic ladder and this is needed housing for them that's right anywhere from minimum wage to probably twenty dollars an hour or somewhere in that range would be the income eligibility for for living in this unit in this complex there will be a, no, a number of market rate units as well uh, in there and I don't know the split offhand uh, because they're still in their their proposal stage but um, so the council formally agreed to sell the property um, uh, at 16th and Pepper uh, last night at the council meeting. And that we'll see probably, um, I think it's about a $6 million development in which will probably translate into 3 to $4 million in tax increment, uh, which is which is welcome news when, uh, you know, the state continues to make things exempt in the city. Um, we, we need to continue to add a new tax base uh, for, for all the taxing jurisdictions benefit, really. And, but that still leaves this property down here at 25th. That does not go, I know the neighbors love their w woods mm -hmm. and everything else, but that's property the city owns and it's not getting anything for it. That's right. And and we have a housing situation in this community. I'll, I'll stop short of calling it a crisis, but I think it's we have a we have a dire situation as it relates to housing and in this market. And that's the Wisconsin Rapids community as a whole. Um, you know, the market went soft. There wasn't a lot of development for a while. Now you see three or four subdivisions uh, being platted and, and now spec homes and other homes being developed in them to now to catch up to some of the demand that had been kind of percolating for some time. So what we've done internally, we've just drafted um, a proposal for a project, uh, what we hope the council will consider uh, in September um, at its meeting for the 25th and Alton Street property um, that will entail primarily single family homes. Um, but we're going to put it out for local developers who you know are very qualified in, in doing subdivision developments. Um, we may not lead it like we did the Savon subdivision for those listeners that might be familiar with when the city he did um, uh, 25th and uh, Bulls and Bulls Circle down in that area. Um, but this will be a little bit different, um, but we plan to um, put minimum standards on what the construction investment might be. So $150,000 homes, perhaps, and above uh, that, um, you know, certain lot sizes, you can only purchase one lot, so you can't buy all the lots and then they don't get developed, um, but with some restrictions. So we hope to put that out in front of the city council in September. This was a request of them to say, well, now you've heard what the neighbors said. We want to see it developed. Give us something to react to. So uh, we believe that we'll have a good um, good product to put in front of the city council, and hopefully they're, they'll help make it even better when it comes that time in September. Um, but ultimately, we need to continue to promote um, new housing development in the city, or our market is just not going to be attractive to employers and to businesses, because that's all what it comes down to. Housing is the first impediment to attracting or retaining business in this community. Um, that's what I've heard from a number of folks in business, is that uh, this area uh, needs housing. Yeah. Uh, and, and needs new quality housing right. right and that's something that our market has lacked for some time okay so this would be well did you think if this development were to happen that would help incentivize other developments in other parts of the city similarly we believe so you know the, the challenge that the city has is there isn't a tremendous amount of greenfield space okay. right there's not a lot of vacant property that is undeveloped um, so at this stage you know we're, we're trying to use the property the city has and identify what is its highest and best use and in this case density if it wasn't apartments and townhouses single-family homes would be the next level downward I guess in terms of 
terms of investment and increment tax tax base increment opportunity. So you know we've got some property around the city that has some availability for subdivision and subdividing of, of property, but not a tremendous amount. There's there's actually a fair amount just south uh, in that vicinity, 25th and Alton, mm-hmm. both east east and west of 25th Ave. Um, so we we plan to work with those those property owners to somehow incentivize or or to help make uh, some housing developments happen. Okay. All aboard Taxi Cab LLC. Mm-hmm. Are we going to have uh, c- competing cab companies in the city? What? Well, we we now will uh, effective last night. We have three taxi cab services in the city. Uh, one is truly public transit, and that remains the uh, uh, River City's cab, which is subsidized by the city through a um, share ride taxi service grant that the city, the mass transit grant that the city gets from the state and the federal government. So we still will have our main state cab service, which the city contracts with. Um, but we did have proposals over the last, well, last night and then some time ago um, for a private individual uh, cab service. And so we had all aboard taxi cab um, get their license approved last night um, at the council meeting so they're they're effectively um, approved and permitted to operate it within the city now um, so that in addition to um, uh, rapids quick cab uh, which people have probably noticed running around town so um, they're not to the scale that river city's cab is but they run one or two cabs uh, respectively okay uh, so there what does that say about the future for the main one I would say one of the things we've struggled with is demand for our taxi cab service has has grown astronomically and the amount of vehicles and drivers that we have to meet the demand hasn't. So there has been opportunity for startup services like mm-hmm. these to exist. The challenge is not all of them take um, Tavern League vouchers, Safe Ride Home vouchers. So, um, you know, only one of them does to my knowledge, and that's our River Cities cab um, that that uh, operates in the city. So, you know, I, there there is demand that exceeds our, our, uh, our service today. And so we've been actually talking with the county, for example, uh, in human services to say, well, how you've got buses running. How do we provide some regular transportation for folks um, that are going to employers every day at a certain time so they're not having to wait for a cab, which may get hung up, may have to pick somebody else up. I mean, there's some major variables in that. And sometimes people are getting to work late. And when employers have people showing up to work late, they don't keep that job for very long. Uh, This leads into something uh, that's been talked about with folks of your generation and millennials they want they like using public transit right uh, and they want uh, it to be affordable and easily accessible and wisconsin rapids for a long time despite being spread out the way it is has had just one little cab company mm-hmm. and but i can remember there was if you look study the history of the of the area there used to be a a rail line, oh, right? And yeah, that, a trolley car, a trolley mm-hmm. car mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. ran between Rapids, Port Edwards, and Nakusa. Are, and Nakusa. Yeah. Are we coming back as this area begins to develop and we get a different culture developing and a different type mindset about car ownership mm-hmm. and, and the like? Is are, is this going to be an entrepreneurial opportunity for someone to develop a, a mass transit system in this area? I think to some degree, we've had some discussion about re, um, you know, picking up a, a scheduled service throughout the city. You know, a single line of, of a bus that might take people from one point in town, maybe from the west side to the east side, with a number of stops in between. Um, we really didn't develop that any further because the demand yet is still sure, uncertain. Right. But there's been some question and conversations with Lamer perhaps to say well you know if you were to study this and the markets there they would do it and they've told us that but they've got to obviously do the due diligence to see what that were and then you got sand valley right and shuttle i understand there's one business person that's running shuttles from alexander field out to sand valley right yes yeah, so you could have a whole but and then you get you got your ubers and your yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. uh, is the city ready for uh, does the city understand how the transportation 
industry is changing. I, I think so, and I think the other dynamic that, that hasn't been mentioned, and that is bike share. Uh, okay. You well, know, the Wood County Bike Share Program, which has an unbelievable amount of users. It's crazy to me. I never knew that Sleepy Bike Share, which is a very unique, it's a rural scale. You know, it's not high tech. It's very low fact, tech. In fact, I'm going to be playing a PSA I did on River Riders Bike Share. Yeah, it's a great the- program. And one of the things that we learned, we thought it was for leisure riders and things, the biggest users were those that didn't have access to a car. So whether or not they had lost their driver's license, but they needed to get to work or needed to get to the store, that's a, one of the largest users of our bike share program is people that didn't have access to a car for various reasons. So I think there's there's absolutely the need for a diverse amount of transportation options. Um, in fact, I'm meeting with some of the folks from the health department next week to talk about how do we, if there's a demand as we were seeing with the bike share program, how do we create more of a robust network and, and not do the to the extreme of the larger metropolitans, it's a very expensive and administratively burden, burdensome um, program, but to create more of a, you know, the next level up from our bike share program, uh, which I'm excited about having discussion because as an avid biker myself, you know, there's a lot of residents in addition to myself, as I'm seeing in the numbers that are bikers too, and using that mode of transportation. Um, with that, we'll take a break. You're listening to The Morning Magazine on AM 1320 and WFHR.com. We also welcome our friends from Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. It's our monthly visit with Wisconsin Rapids Mayor Zach Verwing. Back with more right after this. Good morning and welcome back to The Morning Magazine. Presented by Comfort Air Heating, Cooling, Plumbing. It's time for part two. Once again, here's Carl Hilke. And thank you and welcome back everybody to today's show on AM 1320 and streaming live at WFHR.com. And we welcome our friends and my buddy Jesse from Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. And we have our special guest, the new police chief of the city of Wisconsin Rapids, Herman Blevins, is here in the studio. Uh, first off, uh, Chief, welcome. I don't to get real close to that microphone. I nope. So uh, welcome to Wisconsin Rapids. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Okay. Everyone's probably wondering, you probably, uh, this is probably the millionth one time that you've been <laughs> asked, why Wisconsin Grandpa? Had you visited this community before? Or, or? Yes, actually, over the years, uh, we have visited many, many times. That's how we knew about the area, be it uh, from Minocqua on down. I spent <laughs> the majority of my time fishing and things up here and vacationing. It just seemed that we were so happy here in general on vacation, and why not make it your full-time home? Now, uh, what do you find most appealing about the job here in Wisconsin Rapids and, and appealing about the community from a law enforcement standpoint? Well, on a personal standpoint, first of all, the town, uh, I haven't met an unfriendly person since I got here. <laughs> okay. uh, it's been a very welcoming community, and my wife and I are very happy to be here. Um, from a law enforcement perspective, the, the the people of Wisconsin Rapids and the surrounding area should know that they have a, a very professional and very well put together police department protecting them. Um, I'm very proud to be here and when work with these these ladies and gentlemen who are doing such a phenomenal job in law enforcement. Um, it, it is very attractive for me to be here and for that reason that it is. Uh, a professional organization in a, in a town that seems to be very receptive to our, our outreach efforts and our, our law enforcement um, approach. And that, I'm glad you brought that up because um, a person I have on on a monthly basis is the, the, um, the sheriff, Thomas Reichert from Wood County, Wood County uh, Sheriff Thomas Reichert, and he talks about proactive law enforcement and the fact that there's no borders among law enforcement, but getting out, he likes to have his deputies get out and meet people and talk to people. And uh, I noticed from your biography, uh, you're of similar mind when it comes to being proactive and in the community uh, so that people can talk to a police officer. Very much so. Uh, That is my philosophy. That I mean, and you're you're actually describing you know the tenants of community policing, right? Um, that's what we've talked about, right? Uh, I often refer to the police car as the fishbowl, where when the officers are out driving around, they're in they're separated from the community by that wall of glass and steel. Uh, I advocate whatever programs that we can to get our officers out the out of the car, speaking to the residents, just being a, a, approachable and be people. Uh, be it 
um, any type of uh, school activities where we get the officers out with the kids at the schools or just being approachable. Get out of the car, talk to people. That's always been our philosophy. Um, I see that they are very good at that here in Wisconsin Rapids, and I'm very happy about that. We're going to continue that tradition and even build upon it that we get more and more interactions between the people and the officers. And with this city being the county seat and the county sheriff's department located here, uh, have you had a chance to uh, meet with the Sheriff Riker to talk about the fact that you have both have similar uh, philosophies. Yes, yes, we did. I met with him and his staff uh, on an occasion, and, and we did. We had a conversation about our philosophies and where we were going as far as as cooperation between agencies, things of that nature. Okay. And speaking of cooperation, what, first of all, I want to thank uh, the sergeant for stopping by yesterday during the noon report to highlight that this exercise. Uh, we should mention it since we're on the air right now. Uh, tomorrow over at Assumption High School area, uh, I, I call it planning for something we hope uh, the unthinkable. It would be an active shooter situation at Assumption High School, and it involves you, fire department, I mean, uh, every... Uh, the whole, the whole gamut from of, of, from police and fire, EMS, all the way through to the the, the hospital. Yes. What for uh, the average person who is wondering about why do these type of exercises? Could you explain why why are these types of exercises are so important? Okay. Um, unfortunately, you can never say it can't happen here. And if you are not prepared for any event eventuality, if it does happen that's where you get the, the you know the failures i believe in training constant training for all types of, of things including this where a school shooter active shooter type mass casualty event is something that it gives are my officers the ems personnel the fire department everyone who's going to be involved in this is going to get some first-hand experience on how to manage an incident such as this um, it takes a lot of parts to coming together to manage a situation, ours, the police, and the initial response to the to the threat, which would be a gunman or or what it, whatever it would be, to the evacuation of the wounded, to setting up the command posts and the emergency operations centers as far as the city or the county, all those things need to be done before you need to do it, which is why we do these drills. So when God forbid something does happen, at least we have that 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 muscle memory and that and that training that this is what has to be done in this order. Okay, so and so folks, don't panic. <laughs> Tomorrow morning it starts around nine, and as we've told you uh, on the air, um, stay out of the area if you don't need to be there. I, I I understand the residents around the area have been contacted. Yes, yes, we have. We we contacted all the the residents and and the houses in the adjacent area of the school with flyers to let them know what was going on so that it's not a surprise to them. Yeah. Well, I, I know I'm still going to get calls. What's going on at, mm -hmm. <laughs> at Assumption? Uh, and for, from a mayoral standpoint, you would have to, you would be playing a major role in, God forbid, some kind of a uh, major emergency like that. You need to know that the emergency services that you uh, help run Right. are ready for it. Well, an emergency response, as sort of the chief was alluding to, is it requires all hands on deck, right? And, and mm -hmm. the fact that there's so many different agencies involved. The mayor's role is, is primarily involved in opening the emergency operations center, calling for the opening of that, um, working in conjunction with the city's um, point of contact related to communications, uh, the, so the public information officer, the PIO, um, and obviously overseeing kind of the, the bigger picture, right? There's obviously finances that are involved. Sometimes if you, if you need to bring and equipment uh, or, or um, new manpower. I mean, there's a whole host of things that can happen depending on the nature of the incident. Um, so when we had some flooding uh, happen in the, in the recent years, right. not the extreme flooding, that was unfortunately or fortunately for me before my time, um, but we had to open the emergency operations center and have uh, communications open between the dam operators, public safety, uh, and anybody else that uh, streets and Department of Public Works and controlling traffic. Um, so there's a whole host of um, kind of ways that, that emergency operations and emergency preparedness touches everybody and having tr folks train not only the the career servants or professionals that are being paid by the city but everyone has a role even the older persons to some degree um, so uh, we continue to assess it and I think you know the chief's coming at a great time where this functional is happening in the sense that we can assess where our gaps might be and then you have your hot wash following the event that really figures out and puts it all on the table if there were gaps or opportunities for further retraining and, and experience sharing that's it too 
too. After this exercise, you'll have a debriefing and all the agencies will get together and go and talk about what they learned. Well, actually, that's a major part of an exercise like this is, is to get together as the hot wash or, or the debriefing at the end of the exercise to talk about what went well, what didn't go so good, and what we can do better in the future. Uh, that is the purpose of this. We learn from it. If And the next time we do one, we'll, we'll apply those lessons learned. And me personally, again, I would rather we have those lessons learned in training. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in the city, uh, it's a new city. It's a city uh, with uh, two unique si uh, sides of the river, west side and, and the east side. And uh, I'm sure you are getting been getting some feedback on the law enforcement uh, needs of, of the city. What are some of the issues that people uh, have brought to your attention? I know people are concerned about drugs, and but that's like every community in America. But feel free to talk about that or any, any of the things that people have brought to you since you be became chief and they said, hey, sir, I, we want you to address this. Um, Wisconsin Rapids is not unique in that the concerns of the, uh, the citizens mm -hmm. here are the concerns of citizens nearly everywhere. Um, we call them quality of life issues, things of that nature. Um, some of the things personally that I have had, you know, some feedback from people on, uh, not only it would be the, the drug problem, which is, again, not unique to Wisconsin Rapids. It is a nationwide problem. Um, some of the, of the other things, that we, truck traffic on certain roads mm -hmm. has been an issue which we've been dealing with. Um, unlicensed uh, vendors, uh, uh, ice cream trucks, things of that nature that have have come across my desk where we've had. So it's, it's, it's it runs the gamut from <laughs> yeah, the major things all the way down through, you know, speeders on certain streets, which we address by putting out the speed trailer and, and things and doing some traffic enforcement. Um, Again, very much the same, whether it's here or Chicago, this, those, those concerns of folks. And um, folks do have, again, I call them quality of life, is that what impacts your quality of life in one neighborhood may be loud music and squealing car tires, where in another neighborhood your quality of life is, is maybe you know, having a drug house or things of that nature. So what's your philosophy in addressing all of these quality of life issues? Everyone's issue is important to them. So my my philosophy is we address the issue that is important to you. Like I just said, your quality of life issue on, on one side of town, it may not be the same as someone else's, but it's just as important to you. So we are going to devote our time and attention to your concerns to the best of our abilities. We always do. And whether it be that loud music or, or you know, things of that nature or addressing a, a drug house. Uh, no no concern, no problem is is not dealt with just before you arrived the mayor and i were talking about the fact that we got three <laughs> cab companies now the, of course the main one and two smaller ones from does that pose problems for law enforcement uh, or challenges or unique challenges i don't so much see the, the uh, taxi companies being a challenge for us as long as you know all the the you know the permitting and things of that mm -hmm. nature are met uh, i see that as being a resource to those folks in town who don't have uh, you know uh the ability to, to drive, the, the means to drive, or maybe should not be driving. Uh, if, if we have accessible transportation, then maybe we will keep those people who shouldn't be driving off the road in cases of, you know, they've had a couple too many things of that nature. Um, I'm actually excited that there are, okay. you know, alternatives for folks to, to get the rides. Okay. I think that touches on a bigger issue that you touched on related to permitting. I think I our, our, we spend the bulk of our time at City Hall, not necessarily my time or the Chief's time individually, but all the administrative staff dealing with issues that have never been asked for permission first, right? They haven't gotten the proper because approvals and permits. I and <laughs> it's a very simple thing to do. It's a visit or it's a visit to the city's website in some cases to get the approvals and the and, and the permission necessary to do what you're going to do. We're, we're seeing, well, this, I love uh, the, the city during the, this time of year because of farm stands and the like. But well, there's been other stands that pop up and people go, what the heck is that? And do we have uh, it under control in terms of people putting up a stand selling food items and the like? Well, and that's our first obligation is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our people, our citizenry, oh. visitors, and, and those mm -hmm. residents alike. And, um, you know, everything generally has some sort of permit, whether there's a cost to the permit or not. We want to do that to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our residents. Now, if you talk about 
temporary permits or the stands that you see around mm-hmm. town. We have a very straightforward process for that. It's it's not like you have to get a city council approval, you know, or you've got to sit in front of a board, but you do have to show up to an office or, you know, fill out the permit request online uh, because there's certain inspection. Sometimes there's a health code uh, requirement and that's not governed or administered by the city, but by the county. And so I think there's good reasons for, for these types of permits. And it's a lot less costly uh, to get your permission up front than to have to get it granted on the back end. Okay. I, I, um, people from outside bring different views when they come to a community. You've been now chief for a while, and anything that you're seeing, you're going, I'd like to change this, or I would like to do this. Anything that's come to mind? Yes, it's a, it's a little early yet. Um, I've been here for, what, a week and a month, uh, a month and a week or so. I'm still evaluating a lot of things, but there are things that, yes, I'd like to bring um, down the road. When the time is right, there's there's programs that I'd like to introduce. Um, one of the things that, and I just came from from the high school just before I came here this morning, okay. uh, doing some training and things for the teachers and staff, and having some conversations with them on how the the police department and the school district can work even more closely together. Uh, I, I I desire a, a a very close relationship between the schools and the police department. Um, what happens in the schools? is eventually going to be out, you know out in town to where we're going to bring be the, bring these young people up to be young adults uh, one of my desires is to have frequent and positive contact with police officers with the young kids and one of the things that I was discussing with the uh, the new superintendent of the Wisconsin mm-hmm. schools uh, rapid schools is a uh, it's called an adopt a school program and a lunch with a cop program where we get just not only the school resource officers who are assigned to the schools but the everyday police officers spend some time in each and every school in the district getting just being accessible to the kids interacting and just having those positive interactions mm-hmm. with the kids rather than you know maybe there's some of these kids the only time they ever see a police officer is in a negative uh, time in their life I would rather that they also experience that see that the police again goes back to the community policing as well it's just that we are people we want to be you know approached we want to talk to you and and the more familiar that they become with the police, the less, you know. Yeah, they develop a, a, a communication on a regular Correct. basis, and maybe that helps you find a hey, officer so and so. There's something going on over here. I don't know what to do about this, or maybe they have problems uh, with bullying or something yes. like that. Yes. The Before- more comfortable these kids are with my officers, the the more that they are going to share things such as that, like bullying or problems in the neighborhood, things like that. Um, so that's that's one of the things that when I first okay. came here, I was hoping to do to answer your question was to have a a very close relationship with the school district and, and the super the new superintendent, who is as new as I am. I mean, he was one of the first people that I reached out to to have a meeting with, so we get to know each other. Um, and I, I anticipate having a, a very uh, beneficial relationship down the road. I, I, I like your approach, uh, and that is uh, to. Police officers are no different than anybody. I, uh, Sheriff Reichert has, has said this. They're human beings, too. Uh, we're all human beings. We all want to be uh, live in a good community. Uh, Sheriff Reichert has made it a point of encouraging his officers to be involved volunteering in things, yes. to help out, to be visible, and to show folks this is the positive face of law enforcement. And it sounds like you're, you. That's what you want for your PD. Yes, because and, and you know this is my personal feelings, but you know the last six seven years have not been um, good for anyone, police or otherwise, mm-hmm. as far as the the current climate. I feel I owe it to my profession and to my fellow police officers to do as much as I can to change those perceptions. Okay. And and the way we do that is to have those is is to be part of the community. We're, we are part of the community that we police. Okay. We're going to take a quick break, and then I'll, we'll be back to wrap up uh, this edition of the Morning Magazine, Wisconsin Rapids Mayor. Uh, Zach Verwinks is here, and uh, Police Chief uh, Erman Blevins is here, too, uh, on the Morning Magazine. Back with more right after this. Uh, Mayor, when you hear this type of uh, uh, attitude about policing, this is what I would think this is the uh, uh, fits with what you and I have talked about before about quality of life issues mm-hmm. and uh, getting everybody that's involved 
at the table to talk about quality of life. That's right. And I think, you know, the community works best when residents and their administration and their elected leaders are working together and pulling in the same direction. And I think um, the chief is obviously, as he's indicated, inherited a, a great department. You know, there's, there's very willing and capable individuals in that department to you know, police and protect the community, but there's also goes beyond that, and that's been touched in the community policing mindset that, you know, we can engage with residents to empower them to know uh, how they can sometimes take matters, not necessarily into their own hands per se, but, you know, if there's a dispute down the street and they're observing it or something, they, they know who to contact. They they know, uh, they feel empowered as opposed to trying to, you know, feel like, well, they're never going to, the, the police department or the city or whoever is never going to solve those situations. So I think, you know, and that same goes for all uh, our ordinance control of we get calls on air from time to time about certain situations in town that, uh, you know, have, have gone w- way beyond where maybe they should have in terms of getting them remedy, whether it's tall grass complaints or whether it's, uh, you know, other violations, nuisance issues. I think, um, you know, we haven't really seen the nuisance ordinance get into full practice yet. But, but um, you know, I think we're you know, in situations like that. Residents are going to be pleased to see um, how we've listened to them. We've been taking action to reflect some of their issues and concerns. Um, and sometimes that action uh, takes political will and support by residents to show up to meetings and say, we need this. We want to preserve the character and integrity of our neighborhood. We see a decline or a slide in the wrong direction. And, and uh, we believe that these sorts of protections or safeguards are going to change that. And th- that is a key part of um, p- crime prevention is maintaining quality neighborhoods. Yes. And in neighborhoods that where people interact with one another and can and like so i get you i would like your philosophy yeah, on things absolutely. like neighborhood watches and, and the. the police cannot do it alone um that is the, the our primary uh message is that this is a partnership this is a community community are people coming together whether and it, for crime prevention again the police we, we aren't all seeing all knowing and everywhere we need help and by forming these partnerships through neighborhood watches, uh, crime prevention groups, uh, and, and things of that nature, they help us help them by helping to police the community on their own. Uh, not, you know, in the manner that, you know, they're not out being the police, no. but they're, they're assisting us. They're being a resource to us, and they're being problem solvers. Uh, there are... are so many uh, so many variables but the, to, to have that community interaction between the police the citizens and groups is is fundamental to having a true crime you know uh, community that is not crime free but is a very nice place to live and things of that nature um, without those with, without the cooperation or the the uh, partnerships that we we've made with people our jobs would be nearly impossible um, mid state technical college has a very good uh, training uh, program and you, you mentioned you want to have good relationships with the schools and, and students and the like and that can also be a, a, a mentoring young people who are interested maybe in a law enforcement career yes uh, and there might be someone who wants to be a chief someday. <laughs> what got you into law enforcement? Um, long story, actually. Um, I just I was in the military, and uh, during a a, a, a a change of station, a short rotation that I was I was, they they made me a, a base police officer for a couple of months, and I kind of caught the bug. And once I, I got out of the military because I was getting married, I. I just I took a test uh, at, at a town in Illinois that I wanted to work, and uh, that was twenty almost twenty almost twenty eight years ago. Well, thank you for your service twice, I guess, both in your law enforcement career, but also in, in your military career. Well, welcome to the community. Thank and, you. Thank and you. I'm here. Uh, uh, any any way I can help you, or uh, our station can help get word out on, on important programs that you may initiate, or if uh, God forbid some emergency situations, please make use of us. I will. I'll reach out whenever we have something that we want the public to know about. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we'll reach out and we can do a segment. Oh, we'll be glad to have you here, and uh, Mayor. And final thoughts from you as we wrap up. I think another informative show. If residents have questions or concerns, they can certainly call the police department and speak to the chief or myself or stop and see us at City Hall. We're there and, and ready to, to have conversation. And, you know, we appreciate the opportunity, too, to share kind of an inside look on, on various initiatives and, and perspectives in which we, we tend to operate. Well, I'm, I'm the, just hearing the news about the fact that we have folks from outside this area who see what the, uh, the chief 
Blevins ha has seen, uh, the, we have a, this is a community that they're interested in investing in. And it, hey, we're in a community in transition, and uh, let's go forward. That's right. You know, we beat ourselves up oftentimes more so than we should, and, and for good reasons sometimes too. We need to, you know, beat ourselves, give ourselves a kick in the butt sometimes. But believe me, there's there's opportunity here, and people are seeing it. Well, I'm going to let you both get back to your day jobs. I want to thank you both for your time this morning on the Morning Magazine. Thank Thanks, you. Carl. Okay. And that's going to do it for this edition of The Morning Magazine on AM 1320 and streaming live at WFHR.com. We also uh, thank Jesse from Wisconsin Rapids Community Media for being here. You can view that on their website or on your favorite uh, uh, public access channel on your cable system.